Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell. The first time any of us have done anything in week 18 of the <laughs> NFL season because there has never been a week in 18 of the NFL well, season. A week 18 regular season, yes. Yes, that is correct. Yes. But uh, Greg, I don't I don't know at this point if that just extra week of the regular season if that feels any longer than it has in years past, but I know it's exciting times in the NFL and we're getting ready to ramp up for the best part. Without question. I mean, you know, obviously that the, the Titans will know what they need to do on Sunday because of what happens on Saturday, because if KC wins, then the Titans must win or they will not be the number one seed. Right. And I'm sure they would like to have a week off. <laughs> yes. I think, uh, I think a, an extra buy would be appreciated. Yep. by everybody in Nashville. And uh, certainly we would love that. My girlfriend would love that as well. So she can get me out of football. <laughs> season for a minute. And, and of course, this is all about you, Buck. So we want to make sure that that happens. Greg, there ain't nothing in my life that isn't about me, buddy. I got I to I figure out how it works for me first, and then we'll keep it moving. <laughs> but no, let's, let's talk about the Titans. They're trying to keep it moving. They did uh, so successfully in getting a, a, a very diff, I would say, I would say a dominant win in certain aspects based on the way that they were able to run the ball on Miami, a good defense, you know, under any circumstances. Yes. But it was, it was, if you reduce it to its simplest terms, the cliff notes version of the victory was run game and defense. Yeah. That's what led to the victory. And clearly this is a very good defense. And we saw that their template, particularly, um, particularly playing the pass game is, pretty much been what it's been much of the season their defensive profile that's been successful has been high percentage four man defensive line pass rush with the ability to generate pressure especially in passing down in distant situations and a good mix of coverage on the back end and what they've kind of added over the last month or so has uh in their dime package has been Dane Cruikshank as the tight end matchup on yeah, third yeah. down out of dime. And I think that's become kind of a key component. And obviously it depends who the tight end that they might play in, in the playoffs is, but uh, obviously they've, they've done it against quality tight ends. We saw it against Mike Gusecki, who's certainly a quality receiving tight end. And really after Jalen Waddle, the, the other weapon for the Dolphins. Yeah, and the Miami was not able to put much together at all throughout the course of that game. Greg, I mean, I think the the general, you know, cliche thought about this time of year and the style of play that you just described is you can win football games running the ball and playing high level defense. Now, well, that's that's at a great some question. point. <laughs> they yes. need to be able to pass at some that's point. A great, that's a great need- question, and and you know, there's no look. One thing I learned very early on when I started with the matchup show in 1984 and really then started uh, shortly after to get a chance to speak to a lot of coaches, which of course I've been doing for years and years now is there's many ways to win. So there's no absolutes. You speak in percentages. If, if, If you were to say about a given team that their pass game is not particularly productive, most people would then say, oh, well, it'd be tough to win in the playoffs. But you're not going to say that as a mathematical equation. Every game plays out differently. Look, they know they need more from their pass game. They know when they get into playing better opponents um, that they're not necessarily going to hold opponents to three or six or 10 points. I mean, look what happened earlier in the season when they beat one of the AFC's better teams, the Buffalo Bills. In a, and I believe that was a 34-31 game, if memory that, serves me correctly. That's correct. You know, so you're going to have to score. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. But look, they've been able to to win some of these games going down the stretch to put them in a position to get a first round buy. Um, they've been able to win some of these games without the passing game having to be a big factor. Uh, history and percentages tell you that that's not likely to happen in a, in a three game Super Bowl run, right. that, that the pass game is going to have to become a meaningful factor. Now, by that, Buck, I don't mean that Stan Tannehill has to go 30 for 40 for 450 yards and four touchdowns. You know, I don't want people to think that's what I'm speaking about, but there needs to be some explosive element to the pass game. And that's what they've lacked all year long, basically outside of, you know, AJ going crazy in his first game back 
against San Francisco, there have been plays here and there from Nick Westbrook Aquina and a lot of the guys that they've had to put in those positions. But at this point, it's still a deficiency within that offense that, as we talked about every week on this podcast, Greg, any time at any point against any NFL team, your weaknesses can come up. So it's just a matter of how you kind of manage them. So what you've seen from the Titans pass game, Greg, because it really, I mean, both both of these teams kind of struggled on offense. The first five possessions were punts before the Titans started to find some forward momentum. What What's kind of standing out about their pass game that hasn't, that seemed like it might've been fixed after the AJ Brown game against San Francisco that didn't necessarily materialize here? Well, the only thing I will say about the AJ Brown game, which was ultimately to me, as we spoke, a Tannehill, Tannehill game, game because of the third down play of Tannehill yeah. um, was when they needed the pass game in that game, it was there. So that was a positive. Um, so the question is if they need it in a game throughout a game, you know, because of the nature of a game, can it be there with some kind of consistency? Because right now, they don't really do much in the past game. When I say do much, I mean tactically. You know, what, what is their past game right now? When he hits Brown for 25 yards on their staple play, the quick five-step drop play action, Tannehill's under center. It's, it's what I call bang play action. He hits his back foot and he, and he sticks it to Brown on the inbreaker. And he would have thrown it a little sooner, but Brown had slipped and he just needed to make sure Brown wasn't going to fall down. Right. Then they did the exact same thing on Brown, 16 yards on first and 10 on their fourth possession. Same concept, different coverage. So Brown ran the sit route, you know, and so, but it's the same concept. There's, there's no real um, multiplicity, diversity to their pass game right now. Um, they don't try to do it because they haven't had to. Yeah. Uh, and then, as I said, when they had to, it was effective. So that's what they're counting on. The fact that, Hey, if they get into a game, let's say they get a buy. Okay. I mean, look, Houston is not as easy an opponent as many think, but let's assume they win and they get a buy. Um, I, I, we have no idea who they'd be playing, so let's not even speculate. Not at this point. But somewhere along the line, they're going to play a team that can score enough where the Titans have to score. Have to score. I don't mean where they can just play the game and let it flow like they were able to play this past game against Miami, a game where they have to score. And the AFC is loaded with teams like that, from wildcard teams like the Colts to what we saw Kansas City and Cincinnati doing this weekend they have to be able to keep up in some form or fashion or to be able to play in that kind of a game that kind of takes them outside of what they normally right. like to do i, I think and, Greg, and look go ahead just to make a final point we know it appears they'll get derrick henry back for the playoffs certainly right. if they have a bye he'll be back yeah. um so um i would not expect him to play this week uh but again that's not my call but he certainly will be back for the playoffs um I, we know what Derrick Henry is. He's a great back. He's the best back in the league. And he's the back that theoretically means the most to a team's offense. Um, so the question is, what can they do off of Henry? In other words, I, just getting Henry back, I don't want to come across like, okay, they'll get Henry back. He'll go 28 for 150 and now they're off. Is great. Right. You know, I still, my sense is, they'll still need the pass game to be a factor, even with Derrick Henry. No, without question. And, and honestly, they've found, they've found ways to survive without Derrick Henry. I mean, De like it's not going to look like that for Deontay Foreman every week, but they have found almost the same amount of attempts as Derrick Henry had prior to injury. They've been right there. It's almost the same rushing total as they had uh, with Derrick in the lineup. The only difference is Derrick scored 10 touchdowns in eight games, and without Derrick, they've only been able – to right. get it in on the ground six times. Right. And and obviously what Henry gives you, which the foreman really does not. I know he had a 21-yard touchdown, yeah. a 35-yard run with a direct snap. But but theoretically, foreman does not give you the big play. Derrick Henry can break a 70-yard touchdown on any play, you know, which, which obviously is an explosive play, and it just happens to come from the run game. But uh, you're more likely percentage-wise to get explosive plays in the pass game than in the run game, even with Derrick Henry.
Right. That's that's kind of what's made the Titans a little bit different as they've so often relied on those explosive plays from Derek to make it look a little more explosive than it might actually be. So, with Greg, with the AFC kind of shaking out a little more, that Chargers win knocks three teams out of the postseason contention. Now we have a more defined picture, theoretically, of what this playoff situation is going to look like. But the, the four teams at the top – Outside of the Titans, and unless you want to spend a lot of time on Houston today, I don't necessarily know that there's enough with the Texans to kind of break down. We've talked about Davis Mills. We've talked about when Terod Taylor's in there. Right. I mean, it's it's just it's it is what it is at this yeah, point. Yeah, they've gotten like better. I mean, again, the NFL is so hard to predict. So I'm not going to sit here and say it's going to be a tough game. Maybe the Titans win 31-3. I don't know, yeah. but I can just tell you from the tape that the, the Texans are a better team now than they were seven or eight weeks ago. Which is is important to note because this is also a team that lost to the Texans not so long ago. Right. So not an easy opponent by any stretch of the imagination. But with, with the rest of the games kind of shaking out the way that they did, obviously Kansas City and Cincinnati played this weekend. What, what do you make of the way that Zach Taylor's using Jamar Chase? Because it, it looks like so much fun, that offense. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. And I watched that tape and, and I actually saw a good amount of the game on TV as well, but there were a lot of one-on-ones on the outside and um, they were back shoulders, you know, and obviously the, the long one, which was their first touchdown, he just threw an out ball and he showed just ridiculous speed. I mean, watching that live, it was like, Oh my God, look at that yeah. guy go. I yeah. mean, you know, his, his explosive speed to run away from the defense. I mean, that was just, he simply ran a, an out cut from the slot. So it wasn't, you know, anything special, but what happened, uh, there were a lot of big plays in that game that keep on, you know, back shoulders, throws outside the numbers. One thing about Joe Burrow that I've commented on before, uh, I don't know if you and I have spoken about it, probably not, but I know I've said it in, in many other places is Joe Burrow is very aggressive throwing to the one-on-ones outside the numbers. Yeah. He's very confident and he's very aggressive. So if he sees a one-on-one outside the numbers, whether it's Jamar Chase or whether it's T. Higgins, Higgins caught one as well, a 39-yarder early in the fourth quarter in this game, um, he's going to throw it. He's going to give his receivers a chance to make plays on vertical throws outside the numbers. So uh They're very aggressive and, you know, obviously with Chase and Higgins um, and Higgins also is a 1000 yard receiver this year and Boyd's close. So they have weapons. I know Mixon will not play this week, but he will be back for the playoffs. Yeah, uh, it's it's been really it's been really enjoyable to watch how they've uh, how that offense has kind of come together and and against Kansas City Greg you know I know I know a lot of Chiefs fans were complaining about the officiating you can do that at any point in any given game it feels like it's what not were they worth. complaining about oh just Jenna I mean you know just Chiefs basically what I saw in the comments was the way that the officials they felt botched the end of the game with the uh the flag that ended up setting another opportunity for the for the Bengals oh, oh. to kick a field goal right nothing right. you know nothing drastic but, right you know, right right yeah. the typical complaints that you see on social media of course, um yes. with the chiefs we know that their defense is uh has been the biggest reason probably for their kind of correcting the course that they were on to start but obviously the Bengals were able to have success with them now you talk about the the big plays that jamar chase was able to make was there anything that kind of stood out about the way that Kansas City played Cincinnati that allowed for those big plays to happen no I think Kansas City does what they normally do they play man they there were some snaps of zero they play a lot of cover two and there's a lot of disguise and late movement to get to cover two um I think the Chiefs kind of did what they did look when when they're a completion it's you know it's always easy to say that, oh, don't play man. But what does that mean, Buck? Does that mean you're never going to play one snap of man coverage in an entire game? Um, you know, they had some good man snaps too. So I guess those shouldn't be played either. You know, I, th- those kinds of comments I find really interesting because they tend to come from people who don't watch the game. You know, they see a couple of plays. So never play man coverage against the Bengals. You know, that that's a silly statement to make. Um, 
So I don't think the Chiefs really did anything differently than what they normally do. You know, they were playing with Fenton at um, at right corner and Ward at left corner. You know, some of those throws, those guys were right there. They no, were- I felt Ward had, I, you know, it seems ridiculous to say that Ward played a good game, but like, I didn't know how much more he could have done in that situation. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, um, yeah, if you truly believe that they should never play one snap of man coverage, that's okay. But they did play some man coverage because that's what the Chiefs do. And the Chiefs defense has been very good. There were a number of snaps where Burrow was under duress. And by the way, that's an issue they're going to have to address in the offseason. Their O-line is not very good in pass protection at all. Which is, of course, the big uh, what, what the conversation was around the Bengals draft, opting for Jamar Chase over Panay Sewell. And, and to be honest, I haven't seen much of the Detroit Lions offensive no, line. I was I was uh, a big believer that they should have taken Chase over Sewell. You know, I had said it, and I said this before the draft, so this is not an after the fact statement. Sure. But I had said before the draft that I thought the two best prospects at any position in this draft class were Jamar Chase and, and Kyle Pitts. And, you know, both of those guys have obviously done exceptionally well this year. Yeah, no, they, it's, it's, it's been really fun to watch that connection. And, and theoretically, if they can get Joe Burrow a little more time, that could potentially look even better in years to come. But with, with uh, the final team, the four seed in right now is the Buffalo Bills. Atlanta kind of hung around for a half and then things petered out for them. But what, what stands out to me about Buffalo, Greg, and, and I'm curious what you, what you make of their offense in these last three games, these three wins, is that they seem to have tried to at least commit to running the football more regularly well they're a zone-based run team that's what they want to do um i would say that this week was probably more so than any other week i know singletary had over 20 carries in another game uh but that most of those came in the fourth quarter when they were up by more than one score this game was close and they ran the ball so I don't think they're going to really morph into a running team box. No. Um, obviously when push comes to shove, it's Josh Allen and they ask him to do an awful lot. And the offense clearly revolves around him and for them to win against, you know, a good playoff team, he's going to have to play. Well, he did not play particularly well this week. He's been a little up and down, over the last three, four weeks, he's had some phenomenal moments as he did against New England, as he did in the second half against Tampa yeah. when he led that comeback. But he's also struggled a bit at times. But I don't believe you're seeing any kind of conceptual or philosophical change in their offense. When they get to the playoffs, and I guess they have to win Sunday, then they'd have a home game. Yeah. Um, so if they win Sunday, they get a home game, which I'm sure they want. Um, uh you know, it, it'll be it'll be on Josh Allen. He will be the reason they win or lose. It won't be Devin Singletary. Well, and and I guess you know, there's no way to. I don't know if it's an unfair question to ask. Is that sustainable? Because they've clearly had success with it throughout the course of the regular season, but the postseason feels like just such a different animal. And I don't know if you can continue to play football games like that and have success throughout the course of the postseason. Well, I think it's sustainable in the sense that. If he plays at a really high level, right? Yes, because he can create explosive plays, uh, certainly throwing it and at times with his legs. So it's sustainable in the sense that it's the pass game, and the pass game gives you more than the run game in terms of explosions. So, uh, but on the other hand, if they get into a game where he's just not great, you know, could their offense shut down a little bit? It could. Their defense is good um i I, and i know the numbers for their defense if you look at them and you look over the last couple of years their numbers for defensively are very very good but i'm not sure i would view them as the as a shutdown defense even though the numbers are so good um i think they're a really good defense uh i don't know if they're one of those defenses that just will clamp right down on on real good offenses but i could be wrong who, who, who is that? Who's playing that way right now, Greg, uh, as, as far as defense is concerned around the league, like who would you most, who would you think that's a fair assessment of? Is there a team? Far, 
I have as to far as dominant around, defense. I have to turn around and look at the teams. <laughs> well, that's that's completely yeah. fair. Yeah. I just think it's curious what, um, what you're saying because I, I one doesn't necessarily come to mind for me just off the top of it. Well, I think Tennessee has played that way at times this year. Sure. Um, sure. You know, their front four has been dominant at times. They don't have to blitz to generate pressure. Um, I think the Niners D has played particularly well without good corners uh, over the last month or so, but that's an issue if you get in, you know, when they start playing better opponents, it yeah. could be an issue this week when they play the Rams in a game in which if they win, they're in. And it would obviously hurt the Rams because if the Rams lose and Tampa wins, Tampa becomes the number two seed. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not, you know, Kansas city was playing really, really well for a stretch there really well, as you, as you know, sure. um, Indies, you know, been up and down, but they can play really well. Dallas, Dallas is odd to me because they 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 have the variance is so weird with them. Yes, and they but they have playmakers at all three levels of their defense. Although I'm not one who spends a lot of time because I watch tapes, you know, studying let's say PFF. I don't do that, so no. I don't know what they say. But I would argue that Trayvon Diggs, even though he's got I believe 12 interceptions, is that it? Mm -hmm. I would say he's been very up and down based on tape study. I think he's you know he can he's certainly a ball hawk. He's certainly a playmaker, but I think he's a beatable corner. And, and again, I'm just responding to film study. You know, I don't, I don't know what others do. I, I just know what I do. And I, I think he's a beatable corner. Well, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought that point up because I think a lot of people, you know, how if you're not necessarily watching the tape like somebody like yourself, you're not watching these games back the way that people in, in sports media do, I think people probably associate sacks as an individual stat and interceptions probably too much with how good a player is just based on how many opportunities that particular corner is being tested or how much the defense around the pass rusher kinds of creates for those opportunities. If you're an edge guy to clean up the sacks or whatever the case may be, like, is that kind of what we're doing with digs? Do you think? Well, I don't want to minimize the interception. No, he's made a no. lot of big plays, sure. but you know, again, just because I've watched every Dallas game on tape this year, uh, I, I think he's a beatable player. I think he's beatable with double moves. Um, I think he gives up a lot of plays. Uh, so you know, again, maybe you take your chances throwing at him because he certainly has good hands and he certainly has a feel, but I, I wouldn't put him in the category like, you know, years ago when it was Revis Island and Revis just shut everybody down. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think Trayvon Diggs has played that level of corner, but the point I was making, you asked me about defense. Yeah. Dallas is capable of being dominant because of what they have at all three levels. Yeah. That's they they're they're a fun team to watch. This this is gonna this is setting. I mean, all postseasons are exciting except for college football because that one was particularly bad this weekend. Well, the I thought the you know the Ohio State the Utah game was pretty fun. I don't know. If sure, but it wasn't a playoff game like that. Give me no. give me the ones that count as fun games, Greg. <laughs> you know, it's so funny just to talk about that for a moment. Sure. How interesting it is when Alabama beat um, Cincinnati, and. I, you know, I haven't studied college football yet. You know, I haven't done my start my college work yet. It's still the NFL season. Uh, but so I, I wasn't necessarily aware that Cincinnati played a three, three, five as their base defense. Yeah. And isn't it funny how sometimes football simple, they play a three, three, five. So what did Alabama do? They ran the ball. Yeah. You and know, it worked I, over and over and over. Yeah. Again. I mean, obviously Bryce Young's a great player. That's not the point. And all the talk leading up to the game was about Bryce Young as as was warranted but then they get into the game against a 335 and nick saban's you know like hey they got three down linemen we're gonna run the ball <laughs> we, <laughs> we they can go back to old school alabama football right where, right right like that with derrick henry and it was i mean it was it was i should be shocking isn't the right word but like just seeing how much bigger the alabama players are than the cincinnati players yeah. that didn't turn out to be a too terrible of a of a game plan. Greg, the NFL matchup show coming up this weekend on ESPN. Of course, set your DVRs. Yes. Sal Pal, Greg, Matt Bowen, breaking all the biggest three, games. And just so yeah. people know, again, three shows Saturday morning because of Saturday games. And obviously, we're, we're dealing with two games as sort of the, the centerpiece games this week. We're yeah. dealing with the Rams and the Niners. And then, of course, the um, Chargers and the Raiders. Because that's the game where the winner gets in. I don't follow all these permutations, uh, Buck. I don't know if you do, but I don't know 
what that game means for the loser, but I know the winner is in. Char- Chargers, Raiders, I should know that off the top of my head. I can't say that I do right right now. I'd have to go find my New York yeah. Times playoff predictor. Yeah, I don't I don't look at that that carefully, but I know the winner gets in. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's going to be exciting football. And, of course, you've got Greg to break it down for you and make you help, help you understand a little more what you're watching each and every weekend. Always a pleasure, my friend. I'm happy to be back in uh, the swing of the things. That, you know, New Year, whatever. It's the same podcast. We're going to keep breaking it down. Make sure you leave five-star ratings wherever it is that you are subscribing to the Install with Greg Cosell. And make sure your DVR on the matchup show to get the best insight on the game. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Buck.